الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and thank you for joining this first episode of the Hukuq al-Ibad session here at our Learn Deen Daily Platform organized by al Islamic Center and as part of the Sira online campaign which is being run all through this month. Insha'Allah ta'ala, this is your brother in Islam, Muhammad Abdul Hadi, and we shall be discussing Hukuq al-Ibad in the light of the Sira of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in order for us to be able to understand and retain the information that I'm sharing with you, I've divided this subject or this topic into four sub-topics. And inshallah, that should help you really understand as we go through this session, what are we covering as part of Hukuq al-Ibad. The very first thing is the broad classification of the rights in Islam. The second is the importance of holding these rights. Thirdly, the dangers of transgressing against the rights of Allah and His creation. And finally, we will look at Hukuq al-Ibad in the aspects of Islamic Sharia. The first part, which is the broad classification of the rights in Islam, there are basically two of them. One is Hukukullah and the other one is Hukukul Ibad. While we will focus on Hukukul Ibad, I want to make it very clear that unless one fulfills the rights of Allah that is upon us, then that person would never, that individual would never be able to fulfill the other, which is Hukukul Ibad, which are the rights of the upon the slaves of Allah or the, upon the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so we need to be very sure about going through both of them and taking them parallelly in our life and this is what Islam is all about and just to also give you a perspective of what Allah, the rights uh, of Allah upon his slaves are then there are many rights and one of the first and the most important right is the Tawheed which is the true belief in the divine oneness in his essence, his names and his attributes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about this in several ayat of the Quran. In fact, our shahada, which is la ilaha illallah, alone testifies to this to say that there is no God worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second is to worship Allah alone without associating any partners with him. While we worship in Allah, while one may say that we worship Allah and we worship to Him alone, then its complete meaning only is derived when a person does not, um, does not associate partners with Him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَلَا نُشْرِكُ بِهِ شَيْئًا Worship Allah and join none with Him in worship. The third and the most important also is to show gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our creator who has given us everything without we even asking for them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah, number 152, Therefore remember me and I will remember you and be grateful to me and never be ungrateful to me. While we understand Hukukullah, and like I said, there are many aspects of the rights, and there are many, many such rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon his slaves, but we will stop at that, and that was just to give you a quick understanding of what Hukukullah is. Coming to the main part of our session, or the subject of our session, which is Hukukul Ibad. So my brothers and sisters, Hukukul Ibad are the rights of of the slaves or the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon us. These are many, many of them as well. However, in this session, inshallah, it will give you a consolidated understanding of what these rights are about and why are these rights so important. And it was narrated from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in this famous hadith, and this is hadith called as the hadith of the muflis, in which the Prophet Sallallahu said, addressing to the companions, Do you know what a bankrupt means? Atadruna mal muflis. They said, amongst us, the one who is bankrupt is the one who has no money or wealth. 
He said, clarifying to them, to the companions, the one who is bankrupt among my ummah is the one who will come on the day of resurrection with prayer, with fasting, with zakah, but he will come having insulted this one, slandered that one, consumed the wealth of this one, shed the blood of that one, or beaten this one. They will each be given from the good deeds, and of his good deeds run, if his good deeds run out before the scores have been settled, some of their bad deeds will be taken and cast upon him, then he will be thrown into hell. Imagine the fate of this person who is fantastic, who is good in worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and fulfilling the first part and the first most important category of the rights in Islam, which is huququllah. However, he misses out on al ibad because he does all of these wrongdoings and he oppresses his brother, he oppresses the other Muslim, he oppresses the other human being. And so it results that his good deeds will be given out to them. And if that does not settle the scores, then the Prophet ﷺ said that his bad deeds or their bad deeds will be thrown upon him he will shoulder he will the burden of their bad deeds as well until he finally would eventually get destroyed and he will be thrown into hellfire my brothers and sisters this is not an easy thing this is not something that we can take lightly allah's messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in another hadith allah will gather the people and he gestured with his hand towards syria saying allah will gather the people naked barefoot, uncircumcised, and destitute. And the companion, he asked, O Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what is a destitute? I mean, he understood what the naked, the barefoot, and the uncircumcised would mean. These are physical attributes. But what about a destitute? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, those who have nothing with them, a caller will call out with a voice that will be heard from afar, just as it will be heard from up close. I am the sovereign, the judge, and this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who will call out. And none of the people, and Allah will say, none of the people of paradise should enter paradise when any of the people of hell is seeking remedy or compensation for wrong or grievance from him for having wronged him. And none of the people of hell should enter hell when any of the people of paradise is seeking redress, is seeking compensation from him for having wronged him, even for a slap, even for a slap. I said, how will that be redressed? How will that be compensated when he will come naked, uncircumcised, and barefooted, and a destitute, meaning having nothing? He said, by means of hasanat, by means of good deeds and by means of as-sayyiat, which is by means of the bad deeds. And this relates to the first hadith that I mentioned. His good deeds will be given away. And the, if this does not settle the scores, if it does not settle the wrongdoing that has been done against him, then the bad deeds of theirs will be given to this person until he is doomed. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Help us understand this and implement this in our lives so that we never wrong anyone, even as the hadith said, even if a person only gives a slap. Talk about killing. Talk about doing all the wrong things that are going on in today's world. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us safeguarded. The second subtopic that I mentioned we will discuss today is transgressing against the rights of Allah and the rights of his slaves. The dangers of transgressing these rights. My brothers and sisters, some sins have to do with the matters between a person and his Lord, and the, and the others have to do with the rights of other people, right? And the scholars have stipulated three conditions for sincere repentance from sins having to do with the matters between a person and his Lord. This is between him and Allah. They are giving up the sin, regretting what one has done, and resolving not to go back to that sin. Three things. If we fulfill these three things, then our istighfar, our repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will most likely be accepted by Him, the most forgiving, the most merciful. However, there is a fourth condition that is required. A sin has been done, 
and this is to do with the rights of the other people, then a fourth condition will apply. And this is required for the istighfar, for the uh, sin to be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by restoring his rights to him and asking him for forgiveness. Restoring his rights as well as asking him to forgive. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will then accept that person's forgiveness. It was narrated that Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever has wronged his brother should ask for his pardon before his death. As in the hereafter, there will be neither a dinar or a dirham. He should secure pardon in this life before some of his good deeds are taken and paid to his brother. Or if he has done no good deeds, then some of the bad deeds of his brother are taken to be loaded on him in the hereafter. Let's understand now the third subtopic that I discussed, which is حقوق ibad in the aspects of Islamic Sharia. And every aspect of حقوق ibad has been discussed at length. And this is what we read all through the Quran and all through the many ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Understand my brothers and sisters, there are five higher objectives of Sharia. The first one being preservation of religion, the preservation of life, the preservation of intellect, the preservation of progeny and offsprings, and preservation of the wealth. These are the five things that Allah has sent Islam with, and this is what Islam benefits us with. This is how Hukuq al Ibad is established on earth. These are the conditions, these are the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has laid down as the higher objectives of Sharia. Now, just like every country, every society has to live by laws and regulations, like the United States of America, there is a US law. In India, there is an Indian law. In the European continent, there are European countries that follow an, a particular European law. So all of these laws have been established just in that same way. Islam has an Islamic law, and that is Sharia. By the way, it's wrong to say Sharia law because Sharia itself means law. And you're saying law and law and does not make sense, right? So it is Islamic Sharia. It is the rules and the regulations and the law that has been ordained, that have been given to us in Islam by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I want to really take a step back and help us really understand um, what Sharia law means. Right, because there's a lot around this subject that we've been feed it from a non-authentic source. And many uh, parts of media today, uh, many channels, many mediums highlight Sharia law. And the moment you hear, hear the word Sharia law, you're like, you're barbaric. You're, you're, you're able to easily relate that to cutting of the hands or you're relating that to hanging somebody and then talking about all this bloodshed and everything and, and you know, women's education being deprived. This is not Sharia law. Sharia law or the Islamic Sharia is a pure one that has come for humanity. It is so sad to see how these mediums of, uh, you know, non-authentic sources have actually taught the world something so different than what Sharia is about. And today, inshallah, we will establish this. We will get to see through these higher objectives of Sharia what Sharia actually brings. And is it, if it is a solution, how good a solution it is. Because one thing for sure, the best life a person can live is a prescribed, is, is one that is prescribed by our Creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He created us and He knows us better. And the one that is taught by the mercy to mankind, which is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And as was understood and practiced and preached by the male and the female companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, radiallahu anhum ajma'in. There's a linguistic meaning and there's an Islamic meaning of the word Sharia itself. The word Sharia literally means a waterway that leads to a mainstream. And this is how the Arabs used to use this word, right? A drinking place and a road or a right path. In its meaning itself, it means a path or a way, a body of divine laws, rules, code of conduct, and teachings that are intended to benefit the individual and society and humanity at large. So my brothers and sisters, when a person says 
that I submit my will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a Muslim, that will is actually sharia. That will is the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the commands and the rules and the regulations that Allah has set and has revealed in the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And these are the two main primary sources of where the sharia or the laws of Islam are regulated from, the Quran and the Sunnah. While these two are the main sources and the primary sources of Sharia, there are different ayat and the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that indicate of two more secondary sources. One that is the ijma, which is the scholarly consensus, and the fourth one, which is the qisas, which is the analogy. Analogy or qisas is a combination of the Quran and the Sunnah and the ijma of the scholars and a derivative of a particular ruling is uh, you know taking uh, take shape from there from that understanding of the Quran and the Sunnah and the consensus of the scholars. So let us now, inshallah, go a little bit quickly into each one of these higher objectives of Sharia so that we understand what they mean to us and how they relate to huquq al-ibad. The very first one being preservation of deen, the preservation of the religion. The deen of Islam is a combination of beliefs, rituals, and rules commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to regulate people's relationship to their Lord and the relationship with each other as well. And to ensure the establishment of religion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made belief and worship obligatory upon us. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in Surah Zariyat, Ayah number 56, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created the jinn and the mankind except that they may worship me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in Surah Al-Imran, Ayah number 85, وَمَن يَبْتَغِ غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا فَلَن يُقْبَلَ مِنْهُ وَهُوَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ وَهُوَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ And whoever desires other than Islam, whoever desires other than Islam as a religion, never will it be accepted from him. And he in the hereafter will be amongst the losers. And to ensure its preservation, the rulings relating to the obligation of learning, practicing, and conveying the, the religion of Islam and the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were clearly legislated in Sharia, were clearly legislated in the Islamic law. The second one is preservation of life. Again, to ensure the preservation of human life, which is again talking about huquq al-ibad, Allah has legislated welfare in all aspects of a societal life, such as marriage, healthy eating and living, as well as establishing rules that deny and forbid all means of self-distractions and taking of one's own life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Al-Ma'idah, Ayah number 32, مِنْ أَجْلِ ذَلِكَ كَتَبْنَا عَلَى بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ أَنَّهُ مَنْ قَتَلَ نَفْسًا بِغَيْرِ نَفْسٍ أَوْ فَسَادٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ فَكَأَنَّمَا فَكَأَنَّمَا قَتَلَ النَّاسَ جَمِيعًا وَمَنْ نَحْيَاهَا وَمَنْ أَحْيَاهَا فَكَأَنَّمَا أَحْيَا النَّاسَ جَمِيعًا Because of that, we ordain for the children of Israel that if anyone killed a person not in retaliation or murder, or and to spread mischief in the land, it would be as if he killed all of mankind. If anyone, and if anyone saved a life, just one life as well, and if anyone saved a life, it would be as if he saved the life of all of humanity. These are the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the teachings of Sharia, the Islamic law that makes it 
completely prohibited to take the life of somebody else as well as to put oneself into a situation of being taken away their own life or taking away one's own life through suicide. These are the conditions. These are the several rules and regulations that, are, that have been prescribed in Sharia as far as preservation of life is concerned and in turn feeding in to the idea and to the real rights and obligations that we have on huquq al-ibad. The third one is preservation of the intellect. Subhanallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a deen, he has ordained for us and he has prescribed for us and he has permitted that sound intellect and knowledge be promoted. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu innama al-khamru wal-maysiru wal-ansab wal-ansab wal-azlam rijsum min amal al-shaytan fajtanibuhu la'allakum tuflihun O oh, you who believe in toxicants and gambling, dedication of stones and divination by arrows, that is fortune telling, are an abomination of Satan's handiwork, of shaitan's handiwork, so avoid such abominations that you may prosper. Allah intends for us through the Sharia, through these laws, success so that you may be successful, that you may prosper. And likewise, if... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has made it haram upon us to consume such substances or such things, then Allah expects us to also use our intellect without obstructing it so that we can contemplate on the true purpose of our creation. That we're not lost in this world, that we face the challenges of this world and that we, uh, without being distracted, and we not only do that, but we also are able to contemplate on the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and understand the purpose of why we've been created and looking into the creation of Allah, understanding how powerful, how great our Rabb Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in Surah Al-Ali Imran, ayah number 191, الذين يذكرون الله قياما وقعودا وعلى جنوبهم ويتفكرون ويتفكرون في خلق السماوات والأرض ربنا ما خلقت هذا باطلا ربنا ما خلقت هذا باطلا سبحانك فقنا عذاب النار. Those who remember Allah while standing or sitting or lying on their sides and give thought to the creation of the heavens and the earth, saying, Our Lord, you did not create it, you did not create this aimlessly. Exalted are you above such a thing then protect us from the punishment of the fire. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, Islam came with the Sharia, with the rules and the laws and the regulations, so that we are able to preserve our intellect. The fourth one is the preservation of lineage and offspring. Marriage was legislated in Islam for the preservation of lineage, and intercourse outside marriage was forbidden. For the sake of preserving humans' offsprings, Sharia has legitimated marriage and reproduction. And for the sake of protecting it, Sharia has forbidden adultery and assigned a legal punishment for whoever who commits it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says in Surah Al-Isra, ayah number 32, zina إِنَّهُ كَانَ فَاحِشَةً And do not approach unlawful sexual intercourse. Indeed, it is ever an immorality and an evil way. Moreover, my brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through the protection or preservation of the lineage, has made it binding upon us 
to enter into a contract of marriage and eventually have a society that understands, a society that is responsible. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made preservation of lineage and offspring as one of the higher objectives of Sharia as well. And the fifth and the last one is the preservation of wealth. Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it obligatory for one to support oneself through earning and working hard for it. And that one is responsible. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says that in Surah Al-Baqarah, number 188, وَلَا تَأْكُلُوا أَمْوَالَكُمْ بَيْنَكُمْ بِالْبَاطِلِ And do not consume one another's wealth unjustly or send it in bribery to the rulers in order that they might aid you to consume a portion of the wealth of the people in sin while you know it is unlawful. And this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the sharia, through these higher objectives have made everything possible for huquq al-ibad to be implemented. And those are detailed laws, rules and regulations that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set for all of us as human beings. And I think based on the limited time that we had, this is all we could cover in this particular session, the first episode. There are many more to come insha'Allah ta'ala. With this, I'd like to conclude and like to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the understanding on the four things that we discussed in during this session, which is the classification of the rights in Islam, the importance of upholding these rights, the dangers of transgressing against the rights of Allah and His creation as well as at the end which we discussed about the huquq al-ibad in the aspects of Islamic Sharia wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen